I have one more quick announcement. Uh, there is going to be a plate put out for Passover or a basket for the donations for the meal. Um, that's when it'll be taken. Don't put it in the offering box now. Don't hand it to me ever. Don't ask me about it ever. Uh, but it will do it on, on the night of the meal because uh, different people are helping foot the bill for right now. So Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. Some of you don't know where that's at because we've been in certain parts of Matthew. It comes right after 27, which we finished this morning. That's by way of my bad humor. So some of you thought that was a misprint. It, however, is not a misprint. Well, it's, it is very interesting because the last chapters of all the Gospels are a little different. And Matthew handles, uh, again, uh, very succinctly, quickly what happens, but I want to integrate some of the things into it. So here's where we're going to go. We're going to talk about the resurrection. We're going to talk about Peter and John and the women at the tomb, about guards being bribed about the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24 and that conversation Jesus has with the disciples. We're going to talk about Jesus appearing to his disciples on a various occasions. We're going to talk about Thomas gets to see him. And I know many of you have heard of doubting Thomas. That is not a biblical term. Thomas is last ops, and that's, he's got an issue with that. We're going to talk about Jesus on the beach uh, with his disciples. Um, and I'm kind of tending not to do, but I think I will. We're going to talk about the commission and briefly say, and he ascended. So I really don't want to get too much into that because that will then we'll do the whole book of Acts, and we're not doing it in that direction. So let's just talk a, a briefly about the resurrection and what's going on, and now I'm going to give you my compilation. Uh, the tomb is empty. We've already talked about it in the last class and many other classes, but it's been verified Jesus died. He was truly dead. We talked about how the proof was that, along with the Roman soldier, basically identifying him as dead. I'm going to reiterate this. Again, the Roman soldier was very proficient in the instrument of death. He could kill with no problem. He could make sure you were dead with absolutely no problem. He was never a medical doctor, but he was sure you were gone. He wasn't going back to the scene of the crime. So when the Roman soldiers broke the legs of the non-dead people on the cross, that made them die because they would suffocate to death. Jesus had already given up his spirit. They didn't have to break anything. He was gone. So we see that Jesus is verified as dead by the Roman soldier, which is a really good testimony. Then by others, and then they put him in the tomb. And I don't know about you, but it's, you're supposed to bury dead bodies, not live bodies. And I know some of you will come up to me because you've got bad sense of humor, and you will say, oh, I've seen it in movies, they bury dead pe uh, live people. Quit watching crime movies, and you'll be fine. It's not a norm. That's not a norm. But however, that's where we've been. And what about the resurrection? Because when we talk about different items, I think the resurrection is super important, but we already know he died for our sins. We talked about that in the first class. The resurrection secures other parts of theology, and here's the main thing we've, we're going to look at. He has a victory. He, he is the first fruits of the resurrection. We're next. So that's, and we see that, um, and one of the things we could just go back for a second and just look at in Matthew 27. Now, verse 52, since he was died for his sins, and it says in verse 52, and the tombs were open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered in the city. So when Jesus resurrects, he takes some of those that were captive by being in Abraham's bosom. He takes them along with the thief on the cross to paradise with him, and that's what we would call the first resurrection. And then we're involved in the next coming. Uh, so we'll, we won't look at that within this teaching in Matthew. Uh, so it's important to notice these things. So Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 8, is where we're really aiming at going. But again, these are all the parallel texts we're going to use as I read to you my compilation of this 
section, we're going into the, what we call the resurrection. Um, many times we've talked about different items, and if you notice, we're in a tweener week. I don't know if you realize this. Um, we've already looked at what we, we would call the Gregorian calendar Easter, which happened, and it's already passed. And coming up is Passover, and we're right smack dab sort of in the middle of it. Um, so we're going to be going to Passover weekend talking about his resurrection and the uh, ramifications of that. But let's just read through this, again, this compilation of different verses I have here. Uh, Behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat upon it. His appearance was like lightning, and his garments were white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The Sabbath day coming to an end, and the first day of the week uh, dawning, Mary Magdalene, Mary mother of James, and Salome were coming to the tomb that they may anoint the body of Jesus with sweet spices. As they were going, they asked, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? For the stone was quite large. But upon arrival at the sepulcher, they saw the great stone had been rolled away. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were amazed. But they found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And he said to them, do not be afraid. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See, here is the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter that he will go ahead of you into Galilee, and you will see him there as he told you. While they were amazed by all this, all of this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling garments, and the women were afraid and bowed down with their faces to the earth. Two of them said, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words and departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring word to his disciples. Mary Magdalene ran faster than the other two. Returning from the tomb, she came to Simon Peter and to, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and I put John, and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we know not where they have laid him. And the full report of all the disciples after all the women had collected themselves for, uh, for were, or they were amazed and trembled and silent. It was the women together that reported to the apostles all things that had happened. The apostles did not believe what, what they thought were idle words. Now, here's where we're at, and I'm going to uh, kind of just hint at a few things, which is kind of interesting. Uh, one of the things um, that I've noticed, it's very hard to get a compilation of everything going on. Were there one angel? Where was he sitting? Were there two angels? Who were the angels? Uh, various things. When did Mary Magdalene go, come, whatever? I did the best I could to get a compilation of things, and I believe I'm, I'm looking at my Bible because I know it was somewhere in here that, uh, oh, here, uh, Schofield Study Bible, which is just a study Bible, it says, he says this, combining the four narratives, the order of events on the resurrection morning would seem to be as follows, and he goes through it, but he also adds to the idea that it's very difficult to put them all together. So I'm trying to cover everything best we can. Um, so if it's not perfectly accurate, these things did happen. What order they happened in, I can't be 100% sure. And I've read through it so many times, I became cross-eyed. How many women? What were the name of the women? Who was in charge? Why did you know, one gospel writer not focus on the other women? Why did they exclude this person and that person? And um, again, every gospel writer has an intended audience. And that's what we got to do. And I can't keep going through that every time we do that, but it's important for us to see that and understand that and recognize that. So let's go through part one, and no matter what, um, again, oh, I do have the disclaimer here. Let's do the disclaimer. If you notice, the disclaimer is real small, because the words would have been small, but you wouldn't have seen them. There is a, uh, a difficulty in reconciling the order of minor events in this narrative as presented by the Gospels. We will attempt to do the best we can integrating all the Gospels together. That's all we can do. Um, so if you say to me, after the last lesson in this section, and you say, Eric, you were wrong in this, I'm going to say, okay. <laughs> 
Yeah, but I'm not changing anything, so um, that's how we're going to keep it because uh, I could be mistaken. How's that? But we're going to stick with Matthew 28, 1 through 4. That's exactly what the, Matthew says, so there's no difference here with all the other writers. Behold, there was a great earthquake. I find this interesting because remember I said when Jesus was on the cross, it was a global type of earthquake. This doesn't seem to be that same thing. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his garment was white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Which again is, we got to remember the scenario that was set up by chapter 27. They, the temple uh, officers, the priests, the high chief priests and elders, they set up their guard, which was more than likely an assigned uh, guard for them. Rome wanted to keep peace, and Rome needed to keep peace in Israel. So the place that was really problematic are the three things, right, that we don't talk about. And Rome had a station for politics, especially for religion, because Israel in their overall religion was Judaism, was their number one religion. That's what they were. So that was a legal religion. What comes off of that is Christianity, what we call Christianity today. Um, the way, and that was not really that much of a legal religion if it, when it started going out, so Rome had issues. That's why you see so many different issues happening in the book of Acts. But to kind of briefly go where we're at, we're at the Sabbath is ending. Uh, the Sabbath, I believe this is the second Sabbath that's ending because we're going to the resurrection, so this is the end of the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread going into the second day of it. Um, and it's easy, we could say it this way, what's happening here as the Sabbath ends, which we could, if you want to be real nice, it's bringing a dawn of a new day, which if you think about it, it's kind of, that could preach. What was the resurrection? A dawn of a new day, and, and all for all of history. But we could say it this way, the Sabbath coming to an end, drawing toward a new seven days, because what happens is the Sabbath ends, and now we have a new set of sevens. Um, and that's what's going on here. And it says the women, in verse 1, uh, the women, or Mary Magdalene and Mary, but we know that other women were involved in that, came and looked uh, at the grave. Again, um, if we're doing a roll call, this is who I believe showed up. Again, from the compilation of all the Gospels. We have Mary Magdalene. Um, Mary, the mother of James, Salome, and Joanna. And then it says, other women. So I don't know the true number. I cannot find that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. Um, none of the Gospels say that. I can't see why she wasn't there. But silent just means it's not part of what the, the Gospel writers were trying to present. It doesn't mean she was not there. Um, they came to, so we have this roll call of who's involved in this. Uh, Mary Magdalene seems to be the head drive of what's going on. Again, from other accounts, we know Mary took th the role of being the lead. Uh, and, and I believe when she goes back to Peter and John to report it, she was running. <laughs> she was excited. That's why I said she ran. Um, because I, don't, I can't account for how the women were told to go back, and Mary's the only one that goes back. So, again, it's really hard to pull these all together. But we do know that they came to see the grave. Uh, Thereo is the word there. It means to observe, perceive. It's, it's similar to the word we looked at in the first class. It has to do with theater. But this is more being a spectator. They went there to see the spectacle. They went to the, to the tomb to see things. And it's interesting because what I didn't bring up in the first class is the word harao has to do with, like, see this, a tunnel kind of, to see one object. Did, did you see the eclipse? Well, with glasses. <laughs> did you see the eclipse? Blepo is more of, did you see the, sun, uh, the sunrise, the, the horizon, the expanse of everything? Did you see everything that happened? However, this is an idea of saying, I was there, I was truly a spectator, a witness to what was going on. And I think that's interesting. So these... Um, so we, we also have to put into this when people say, I saw that, and it has to do with mental perception. I think what's going on here, they saw, 
as a spectator, and they mentally perceive something that happened. Because this, this word see on various occasions has to do with something supernatural. And guess what they're seeing? Something supernatural. How many times is people raised from the dead? You know, so it was something very supernatural, this idea here. So we also have to understand that they were, so what I'm saying is basically it was a physical thing to see something as a spectator. It was also a mental thing that they, at that very moment, you would say, okay, empty tomb, we need to investigate this. We need to consider and think what's going on. And maybe their recall would come back and say, Jesus said this. He would resurrect. Uh, so when we talk about this, or I would look into the matter. I would see what's going on. Let's look into it. Let's investigate what's going on. So all of this has to do with this one Greek word. Um, so it's very descriptive, um, which is, in, again, in the Greek, it's in the infinitive, and which is acting as a noun. Uh, but it's not a noun. It's more, it's more presenting itself as a noun, not a verb. So it's acting as a noun, it's even though it's a verb. <laughs> so we would say, to see. They came to see what was going on. They came to the grave they, uh, they, to look as, as if they were in a uh, spectator event. And when they arrived there, they took in what they saw, and they understood, guess what? Something's wrong. Because they had to know the stone was rolled away, and we'll get into all the events. Uh, that, that was part of this, something's not right. And on, on top of that, there was uh, some angelic being or something sitting, someone sitting on top of the stone. I always found that interesting. So the first, uh, oh, that didn't work out right. Okay, the first event was the stone was moved. That should have just been up there by itself. So don't pay attention to door number two. <laughs> so the stone was moved. Uh, they, they were going on their way thinking, who could move the stone for us? Who can move that uh, from, away from the door opening? And they noticed the stone was rolled away, uh, which is fascinating. Uh, some say the stone could weigh up to one to two tons. I don't see it being that big, but it was pretty big. It was probably six foot around. So if you're doing the diameter, it would be six foot in diameter. That's a pretty big size stone because... It's bigger than this kind of thing. Um, and it has to cover a doorway. The doorways weren't, ours are about, what, seven foot, eight foot? It's not that big a door, but it had to cover the door. It had to cover the entrance into the uh, tomb. It was set in some kind of groove, and the women were wondering, who rolled it away? Uh, it's interesting, if you compare the Gospels, that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they say rolled away. John's the only one that says it was taken up, it was lifted up. And again, you want to compare the Gospels. Could something be considered rolled away and be taken up and moved? Yeah, because how did it get away? It was First thought is it rolled away. Now, if it was taken up and put way over there, that would be a different thing. I think it was taken up, up out of the groove and moved to the side, so it looked as if it was rolled away, but it was taken up out of the groove. Um, We'll account for some of that as we go through this section. Um, this, it's, it's interesting because it's the same exact word that Mary will say in John chapter 20, verse 2, where they said, they've taken away my Lord. They took up the stone and they took up the Savior. Because she doesn't know who took uh, her Savior, her Lord, away. So the stone was, again, take, rolled away by taking it up out of the way of the entrance. Um, this is no human feat. You would have to have a lot of people to do it. And don't ask me how many. You know, um, there was a boulder in my old house in Homestead that was in the ground. It was, half of it was, well, I, a part of it was showing. And I said, after the hurricane, this is really great. There's a lot of heavy equipment moving all around. And I called some guy over. I go, can you get that rock, <laughs> that rock out of my yard? And he said, sure. This rock was huge. It was like the builders had nothing to do with the planet in my front yard, so I couldn't put anything else there. When he pulled it away, it was huge. It was probably about three, three and a half feet high and about four feet long. And he had a heavy equipment to do that, which, was, which I was glad because he put it out. I don't know where he put it. Put it away from my house. But it left the crater <laughs> kind of thing. The reason I bring this up is because I wasn't about to try and get that thing out. I need a machine to move it. The rock 
or stone that was in front. It was a large, and, and I put in there, it was a large, significantly large stone. So it could weigh upwards of a large amount, which you just don't roll things. Okay, it's in a groove. It'll roll. It's round. That's not how things work. Your car is round tires, right? And if you put it neutral, most of you aren't moving that thing, okay? Uh, but the idea is here, we're really dealing with something that's very heavy. But how did it, and my question is, how did it get out of there? How did it get rolled away and lifted out? Well, verse 2 tells us this, Matthew 28, verse 2. It was a severe earthquake that occurred. Now, I believe this one is now local. The other one was global because it was a significant global event. And we discussed that when we talked about when Jesus was on the cross in Matthew 27. But I believe this was the second earthquake in three days. Now, if you're a seismologist, you would say this was what? Aftershock. The problem is it was global. Aftershock happened globally. I mean, locally. Could that happen? Oh, sure. Um, there's not a lot of fault lines running through Israel. There, are, there, there have been earthquakes in all sorts of places. Um, but I believe this was a great earthquake in the area that it was in, and the earth quaked enough because the this is why. It didn't cause the stone to move. It was because the stone was lifted up. It was part of the effects of what was happening. The angelic beings came down, which, which I believe was an earth-shaking event locally, and lifted that stone, and I believe that's, again, the sign of that was the earth had quaked. And, it's, and then it says... Uh, in verse 2, an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. So those two events are simultaneous. They happened at the same time. Since the second event's up here, and I already kind of looked into it a little bit by leaving it up there, uh, the, there was the arrival of the angel. It says the angel of the Lord descended from heaven. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. This is hard to deal with. And I'll tell you why in a few minutes as we go through this. Um, I have theologically beat myself up, and I'm going to give you some idea of a probability of this character. Now, I believe there was at least three different appearances by some angelic being at the tomb. I don't think they were the same, thing, same ones. I think there was one, and, and it's separated out by various texts, and there's two for something else, okay? Um, but again... It's hard to pull all these together, so I'm going to do my best. So I, it may be a little confusing, but forgive me ahead of time, okay? First of all, you have the arrival of the angel. Uh, his arrival uh, came with this, this supernatural thing that was going on. His appearance, though, was, says is lightning. Light, I find that kind of interesting to describe something as lightning. Uh, it says in verse... Three, his appearance was like lightning, like lightning. Wow, that's just odd to me. I would never describe anybody like lightning. Um, it's interesting, this word lightning means light or light or ray of light or lightning. Um, but lightning is often, this, so bear with me, is often comes along a manifestation of a theophany. Look back in Matthew 24. So we're, we're trying to stay within close conf confines. And Matthew 24 is when Jesus is talking about not only the tribulation, but his return. And verse 27 says, For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So basically, there's, the idea of lightning is kind of tied into the coming of the Son of Man. Uh, we also have to get the idea of the speed is also associated with this word, this, the repetitive, uh, how rapid it was. Um, it's something uh, even to Matthew uh, that is, it, I could say, to, Matthew would say this, he's saying it because it's not comprehensible. How do I tie my hands around the account I'm writing as what these, this appearance of this person was like, this, this being? And you, and you say lightning. Even in Ezekiel 1, in Ezekiel's first vision, the glory of the Lord, there was lightning language involved there. My answer to this is somewhat problematic. Um, I believe it's the very brilliance of the Son of God first coming down as he was pre-incarnate. 
or it was someone assigned to that that had the same glory that was a... Now, here's the problem I have. The brilliance that's connected to this is only connected to the Shekinah glory, the very glory of God. And sitting over the top of the tomb was, is also kind of confusing to me. Why would you prop yourself up there on top of the stone? I mean, it's just kind of really odd. Um, and I think that kind of gives us a visual of this that I believe is what I believe. Now, here's the thing. Most of you are going to have problems with this because I know this, and I do too, to be honest with you. How can Jesus be in two places at once? Well, Jesus isn't right now in two places at once. He's resurrected. Where is he? You understand what I'm saying? He, he, he's not in the tomb. The tomb's what? Empty. And, I say, and I'm going to say this. It is problematic. But Jesus is going to come again in his full glorious appearance. Yes or no? Okay. It will be involved in that. Will be The earth will be quaking. Lightnings will be happening. And there will be an appearance of someone that has a similarity to this. And in, uh, we'll look at it in a minute, but, oh, I have it up here. So we'll look at two verses in a minute that have something to do with it. Whoever this heavenly being is, uh, it exemplified, he exemplified, the very presence of God. That's all we have, okay? We could just stick with that if you want. But I think something's going on beyond that because the, um, the idea of him uh, sat upon the stone um, gives me the kind of picture of being high and lifted up kind of idea. I don't know. I'll be honest. This is really tough. And this is why scripture is meant to teach us and to be chewed upon. And maybe one day I'll have a fuller answer, um, but there's no reason Jesus couldn't be in multiple places because he hadn't made an appearance to anybody yet. And if this was his first one, I'll go with it. But I want you to see something. This is where my food for thought came. Revelation 114 says, his head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. So this is what Christ's appearance will be like in Revelation. In Matthew 17, 2, when Jesus transfigured himself, which didn't seem very difficult for him, um, fully human, right? And it kind of gives us the uh, language that he pulled apart his body and transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became white as light. Whatever we have here, we do have somebody that is significantly presenting the very glory of God and the very presence of God. Um, here's the next event that occurred. The third event, the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men, so they saw him too. I don't know what would shake a Roman guard. I don't know what would it take, um, but just think for a minute. You have the Roman guard who feared no man. They were taught not to fear any, any human being. Um, and the word here that has to, has to do with shook in the verb form, it's a play on words. What does an earthquake do? It shakes, and if you, you're a scientist studying Geological effects are called a what? A seismologist, right? The word seismos is used here, CEO, which is the form of seismology where we get earthquakes. So they shook. As the earth was shaking, they shook like the earth shook. And it was out from the very fear they had. The appearance of this being, this heavenly, we'll just say for right now, this heavenly being, again, the language descended Jesus had used that language for himself, just so you know. He who descended will also ascend up into heaven. He hadn't ascended yet, so he had previously used that language. Um, but this appearance of this heavenly being was not only earthquaking, but it was guard quaking. It shook the guard, and they became as dead, um, which is fascinating because it said they shook with fear as an heiress tense, and they were dead, heiress tense. It means both of those were an event tied to the event. Now, I'm going to read, this is kind of lengthy, but I'm going to read from a commentary I thought was pretty insightful. I don't usually do this, and since I don't usually do this, I'm not going to tell you who it was. So, uh, the precision of the aorist tenses here, because I just told you both in aorist tense, gives us a splendid analysis of the psychology of the fierce smitten men, and we don't know how many guards there were, so I put, how many were there? 
we don't know, who were charged with the responsibility of keeping the stones securely before the door of the tomb. They saw the angel, angels, because later there's multiple beings. That, I put the angels in there. He put angel. They began, to, and the text doesn't tell us it was an angel, by the way. So, um, they saw the angels. They began to tremble as they, their fear intensified. They fainted and fell prostrated, uh, postured before him. He said not a word, being, nor had he made any menacing gesture in their direction. He only appeared and rolled the stone away and sat upon it. What a demonstration of superiority of heaven's power over puny militarism of this unfortunate planet. Pretty, pretty good, isn't it? Wait, it gets better. When there, when, uh, when there then was highly touted bravery, where then was there the highly touted bravery and power of Imperial Rome? Only two days before, they had bowed before Jesus in mock admiration. Then they spit upon him, beat him upon his head with stick, jeered at him and laughed at him while he died. Now they lay unconscious at the feet of one of his angels, so shall all who reject him. And if you just amp it up a little, just food for thought, if it was an appearance of Christ and they did that, that's what they were supposed to be doing for Christ. Shaking for fear and they were dead men walking because they had rejected Christ. Just something to think about. Again, possibly not right. Part two, Matthew chapter 20. We're going back to one and two a little bit. We're going to focus mostly on Mark. That's why I put it in blue. We're going to focus most, mostly on Mark 16, one through four, Luke 24, one and two, and John 21, one. This is the Sabbath day coming to an end in the first day of the week. Uh, dawning, Mary Magdalene, mother of Jesus, uh, James, and Salome were coming to the tomb that they may anoint the body of Jesus with sweet spices. As they were going, they asked, who will roll this away the stone for us for, from, the, uh, from the entrance of the tomb? For a stone was quite large. We already discussed this a little bit. Uh, but upon arrival, the sepulcher, they saw the great stone had been rolled away. Now, it's fascinating. Step back for a second. The first one to see the stone was removed and the tomb was open were the guards. Ready for this? Y'all thinking? Guards were the Gentiles. They were not Jewish people. The first one to see that something had happened, the miraculousness of the resurrection were Gentiles. Keep that in your food for thought. Okay, because we're going to talk about later, they were told to be meeting Jesus in northern Galilee, which is known as the Galilee of the Gentiles. So keep this in, because it's really odd that how Matthew puts this up and and we have the sublime or, or basically the uh, thread running through that still Gentiles are being reached. Now, did they become believers? Absolutely, probably not. But we don't have anything on that. First of all, they came at first light. They came at first light. First, they were first of, their, of the people to come to the tomb. These women had the very first opportunity, at the very first opportunity, came to the tomb. They believed Jesus was what? Resurrected. Yes, they did. Absolutely. No. They came with a specific purpose that Jesus had not been resurrected. And who's going to roll away this, the stone so we can get in and anoint his body with these sweet spices? And that's why they brought them. They brought these because they expected to find him dead. Um, I'm gonna, I don't know if I put it in here. I didn't. I'm going to put it here in a note, which is kind of interesting. The word for spices is the Greek word aroma. Do you know what that is in English? <laughs> it's aroma. <laughs> we, so when you say, hey, that has a nice aroma, you just spoke a Greek word. Uh, so when we talk about what they were doing, they were bringing in aromatics. So the place could smell all flowery or whatever they were using. Um, the, these smells were used to offset uh, decomposition. We've already discussed that. Um, so they were going to the tomb with a purpose. Their purpose was to anoint Jesus' body, to keep it from that stench that would come upon, come upon with um, decomposition, which is kind of just think about this for a minute. 
They come to the tomb. They didn't expect the resurrection. And then we have lots of eyewitness accounts to the resurrection, lots of firsthand eyewitnesses to the resurrection. Because I could stand here this morning and say, I fully believe in the resurrection. I didn't see it. I haven't seen Jesus yet. But I know we will, and I know he is. But I'm not a firsthand or secondhand or longhand um, eyewitness. But no one, listen, no one at that very time, no one at that very time, we will call that um, apostolic time, okay? No one refuted Jesus' miracles, his casting out of demons, all his signs and wonders, and then we have his last sign, and no one refutes this. There is no refutation at that time saying, no, he isn't, and here's what they could do. If they didn't believe the resurrection, present the body. Bring the body of Jesus there. Or just bring a body. Fake it, because you're liars anyway. Fake it. Bring a body. You can go to the dump site at Gehenna and steal one. See, this is Jesus. Who's going to do the DNA testing or dental records? They couldn't even do that because there was so much evidence and so many people that saw him. And we're not going to take the time to show you every incident of Jesus' appearance to different people. We'll cover a few. But they were coming to the tomb with the purpose to anoint him, and they expected the stone to be blocking the entrance. They weren't resurrection friendly. They, were, they wouldn't even have gone there if they had an understanding of what happened because Jesus did tell them many times what to do after the three days, and we'll look into that, where to go and where to be, where he would be. Come to where I will be. That's a good place, you know? In, the, in Do, uh, Donald Barnhouse, and I will say this about this book, famous book, he said the cross, the name of the book is called Cross Through the Empty Tomb. So it's kind of interesting. I don't know if that, that picture was, I'm not going to go back to the picture, but that picture shows looking out of the tomb to the cross. And I, and I think that's cool because yet, we needed Christ to die. The importance is he died for our sins. But without the resurrection, we're going to have some issues, and we'll cover that in the next couple of weeks with the issues we'd have without the resurrection. They had to come together. They had to be all of them or none of them. But each, one, each part of it, the resurrection, I mean, let's start with the crucifixion and the resurrection, could not come alone because he also had to ascend, and today he's in his session. That means he's alive forevermore. And all those go together. You can't separate them out. and can't say one never happened or the other one didn't happen. And death proved both ends. Both death proved the cross was effect, uh, efficient in doing what it had to do, and that when he rose, he rose from the dead. Not just he got up from a long nap. So when we get to Matthew 2, uh, verse uh, 28, verses 3 and 4, it, it, we talked a little bit about the, what, the, what the appearance of the angel was. But um, again, this was an extremely large stone. Uh, it, it's interesting. In the Greek, it's called mega sophadros. Mega is our word. We, we all know mega, right? Mega, we have it, I think, once a week now. Mega millions. Mega, we, and we usually think lots of money. <laughs> Mega means great amount, huge amount. This is the best translation here that we would put, and it's a successively large stone. It's just a large stone. Um, part three, entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side. Now they're going in, now the women are actually entering the tomb, clothed in a white garment, and they were amazed, but they found not the body of the Lord. So again, we have these interesting things happening. Is this the same guy that was sitting that went inside? Is it somebody else? Do you understand where I'm going? I, there's nothing in Scripture that ties these two that the same person. But I do think it's interesting because I think details matter. Yes or no? When, when the Bible says every word in the Word of God is God-breathed, I go from the twos, the word the, any word that's in the Bible, they're all God-breathed. And they all have a significant place. That's why we teach verse by verse. And we go into words and understandings. So let's talk about this, this three things about this young man at the tomb. Okay, because my Bible says in, in, uh, that he was a 
young man. Again, we're using uh, Mark 16.5 if you want to. But we just look up here because we're going to dissect it. First of all, he's a young, he was young. I love the word young. Because now where I'm at in my, anybody less than 50 is young. You understand? I had a guy at the, at the bowling alley last week saying, you're a young guy. I didn't know whether to thank him or say get glasses. But it's, it's kind of a relevant term, isn't it? What is it? What's a young guy? Uh, it's interesting. The word in Greek is ne neonoskos. A neonoskos has to do with the idea um, characterized by being young. Characterized by being young. I still don't know what that means. Yes, that was very not helpful, <laughs> you know? Um, so again, we got to ask, what is it, what is it saying? Um, and, and I'm just going to give you ideas to think with. Um, in Genesis 19.4, the Greek uh, Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uses this idea, the same idea here. The men of Sodom surrounded the house, both young and old. So we can see there's two classes, young and old. I don't think, you know, six-year-olds were in that young group. And I don't know if they surrounded the house that they were 90-year-old guys. I don't know. But they broke it into that idea of there's two groups. In the New Testament, it's used of the rich young ruler. Now I'm thinking he's rich. If he's really young, like, you know, 12 teen, he would have inherited the money, right? If he's in his mid-20s, 30s kind of thing, he may have worked for it. How did he get it? Import-export business. What was he in? Was he in oil and gas? Uh, we don't know. It also says in Gethsemane, uh, in Mark, it says there was a young man who followed Jesus in Gethsemane that ran around naked. Don't ask me about that one either because that's just an obscure verse. I don't know why he was naked. He had issues, probably demonic. Uh, uh, possession kind of thing. And um, there was a widow's son that Christ raised from the dead. He was called Young. And we always picture him. He's like, oh, he's a kid. Um, it's interesting. In 1 John, John addresses the, the people he's writing to. He writes, fathers, young men, children. So now he's got three groups. So we can kind of say, when does child stop? And when does young man begin? So this one was characterized by being young. He's not a child, and he's not old. How old is he? I have no clue. Most people will say in the Bible, when you see something like that, 30-ish. 30-ish. Um, there's certain things in Israel, even today, if you're a kid and you're 15, guess what you get to do? You get to join the military. Okay, 15. Here, we allowed him to smoke and chew gum kind of thing. You know, America's kind of different. Now we're trying to get a law from, to drop the age from 21 to 18 for guns kind of thing. Uh, they're trying to determine who's, who's got enough internal authority to have certain things, you know, and, and that comes with age. Uh, we, don't, we do know that our parents always told us, when you get older, you'll understand. So uh, I don't know what this means. He had the appearance of someone young. He was a man. We could deal with that. Secondly, he was clothed in a white robe. Now, what does that have to do with anything? Well, first of all, most of us don't go around with a robe on that's white, especially in this area that we're at in Israel. It wouldn't be white long. If anybody has anything white, you know, within a few months or years or whatever, it won't be white. It'll be whitish, and you're going to do everything you can in your tenacity to make that as white as you can possibly make it again. Um, the reason I'm re re um, saying that, because it says he was clothed, it says parabola. Clothed, parabola, that's just a weird word. Para means to around. We know, we know the word para from uh, perimeter. You set up a perimeter, it's around the area. And bala, balo means to throw. So we can say this, he was wearing what we'd say a linen garment that was thrown around him, okay, that was white. And this is used, guess where it's used the most times in the book of Revelation? This white robe from head to toe uh, basically says he was encompassed by this white robe. 
and it conveys the idea, holiness in God's glory. Uh, thirdly, he was sitting on the right. Now, that kind of confused me, because I said, okay, he's a good conservative. I mean, what does sitting on the right mean? Why would this even be included by Mark? And here's the interesting thing. Mark is writing his gospel influenced by Peter. So how did Peter know? You know how Peter knew? Mary told him. Okay? So it wasn't gospel. I mean, it wasn't gossip. It was gospel. It was the truth that was being promoted here. And it, this idea of on the right, I know, I'm weird. I looked it up. It's used 15 times in the New Testament, that, that phrase, uh, at the right. Um, it, it has a reference of Jesus standing at the right hand of God, the Father, seated at the right hand of God, the Father. Both those ideas, seated and standing, uh, not only in Matthew, Mark, Luke, but Colossians, Hebrews chapter 8. Oh, wait, the, Hebrews has it the most. Hebrews 1, 3, 8, 1, 10, 12, 12, 2. Where's Jesus? He's, Hebrews is talking about his priestly ministry now. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Seated. 1 Peter 3, 22, same thing. But now we have in Mark 16, 5, a young man clothed in holiness, seated at the right. Yet other places, it talks about two angels being there. Was he angelic or not? But I do say this, the right side is the power, side of power. The brothers, the sons of thunder, asked via themselves, and then mommy, I don't know which came first, mommy came first, or they asked, which one of us will be seated on your right and on your left? I prefer, said James, maybe, I want to be on the right. John says, I want to be close. John's always close. And we know that from the uh, Lord's Supper, how close John was. So with that being said, I leave it at that. Uh, the reaction of the women which I think is interesting, they were astonished, uh, which is, because here's what happens. They were, they were mega astonished. Notice what it says. Let's see if I still have this up. No, I don't. Okay, let me just put this on. So this is taken from my Greek lexicon. So it's, it basically says it's a verb. Uh, be amazed, be astonished, be alarmed. I also want to tell you this is, the root is thumbano, Thumbano is the root, and ek is put on top of it, so it's intensifying it. It's intensifying the root, which means amazed, okay? So the women were amazed. Now, notice as I took this out of my uh, interlinear, it says they were greatly amazed. Now, here's what's happened. They get to the tomb. The stone is rolled or lifted away from the groove, and the entrance is open. They go in. They see no body. They see a young man in white at the right. The reaction was, eh, we're amazed. Doesn't seem to cut it, does it? They were utterly amazed and astonished and struck with terror. What would have been going through their minds? Now, I'm going to say something. I know most of you are going to not like me tomorrow. That's fine. You could not like me for lunch. I don't care. But women tend to be a little bit more emotional than guys. Okay? I don't know what was going through their mind. Jesus is gone. They didn't understand the resurrection. We know that because two minutes ago, they were talking about getting to the tomb, and Jesus, who's going to roll the stone away so we can anoint the body? They get there, stone's rolled away, body's gone, they're thinking a gazillion things. And it's interesting, this term itself is only used by Mark. This is a Markian term. He uses it four times um, to deal with and which is fascinating, in Mark 16, 5 and 6, he uses it twice of those four times. He's basically saying, in this scene, they're intensely super astonished. Was it they were astonished that Jesus rose from the dead? No, I don't think so. I don't think that's part of it. But they were it was a highly, how about this? It's a highly charged event. And not only that, it was also the most important event in all of human history. The tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. Not where have they taken, and Mary will say this, where have they taken my, my Lord, my Savior? But the tomb was empty. The stone had to be rolled away. There was a guard 
I don't know where the guard was at this time. And I can only surmise maybe they're still dead. <laughs> I don't know. Because the guard doesn't seem to have any interaction with these ladies at the tomb. If the guards ran away after it happened, boy, they're in for deep trouble. Not only that, later they're going to try, they're going to take a bribe. They're just goners. As far as Rome's concerned, they're dead men walking anyway. You don't leave your post. You don't allow the tomb to, they should have secured that tomb, right? Who was in charge of securing it? They were. How did it get open? They can walk up and say, we don't know. It was some angel. How's that going to go over in a Roman court? That's not going to work. And now we have these women in the, in the very tomb, so astonished and so shaken with fear. For the tomb was empty. No one's in. Part four. Part four. Um, I don't know how far we'll get in this because I got a ton of issues. And most of you know my issues because I get to talk. Okay? So let me read these and I'll give you some of my issues. He said to them, do not be afraid. Again, using the same term that Mark used in, in verse five. Stop being afraid. Stop being in this condition you're in, this traumatic type of condition. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. One word. He has risen. He's not here. Which they could see. I guess he was just helping them out. See here is the place where they laid him. And go and tell his disciples and Peter, why Peter separated, uh, we can only surmise, that he will go ahead of you into Galilee and you will see him there as he told you. Where's Jesus going to be? How did they know that? Jesus had told them before he's going to be in Galilee. Where are they at? The disciples are not in Galilee. They're not. Because we know wherever they were, it was a tombstone run to their house. Because Mary runs, or even if she jogs or went faster than the other women, she got there to, to them. She couldn't have gone to Galilee. Galilee is in northern Israel. They're not near there. So what we have is this young man tells these women to stop the ongoing action that's happening. Stop being highly uh, charged. Stop being highly astonished over what's going on. Stop this action of fear. Stop being emotional. Stop it. So don't think I just used the word. They used the word too. Stop it. It's not easy to stop an action like this unless you what? You got to disengage your emotions and engage what? Your mind. You got to think. Got to use your intellect. Because otherwise, the emotions will take over. And you, there's no way to just stop it. So he says, stop this action. The Jesus you're looking for, who was crucified, which implies he was dead. And that's why they're at the tomb, because Jesus was dead and they put him in the tomb. He has risen. What a significant term. He has been taken up. He's not here. He is risen. I expected you all to say, he is risen. Indeed. <laughs> it's fascinating. The next group of uh, words we're going to deal with, the next part, they will, they, he will also say to them a follow-up, you can't find a living among the dead. They're going to the tomb to find dead. He's alive. Is he gonna, listen, he's alive. Would he hang out at the tomb and wait for somebody to come visit him? No. Where is he going? Are you listening? He's going to Galilee. We're in Galilee. I mean, that's a big section, right? We're in Galilee. We'll, do, we'll deal with that somewhat. And go tell the disciples and Peter, which I also find fascinating, where the heck are they? And how does Mary and the other women know where they're at? They're in hiding somewhere. Now, Mary wasn't from that area, but we know that a lot of times they spent time in Bethany, which was near Jerusalem. Uh, that could have been a possibility. Um, we know uh, Peter's relatives lived near, somewhat near there. Uh, but here's what you have. I, this is what I believe happens. Mary runs ahead of the women to tell the disciples. Peter and John react, and they take off for the tomb. And the other women arrive afterwards, and they tell the rest of the disciples what's going on. And the reason I say that is because Peter is Mark's resource for writing his gospel, and we're dealing with Mark. This also assumes, oh, he is risen. 
just so you can see that. Tells his disciples. Um, we know he's still around, but not to, uh, together. These, uh, here's the interesting thing. We know there's a separation of disciples. We know that most of them are together. We know Peter and John take the lead to run there. We, we know what later, when he makes appearances, Thomas isn't there. So again, you got all these moving parts that are very hard to kind of gauge where they're at. But I believe that they're, they're together in a place they're not supposed to be right now. They're supposed to be in Galilee. I would assume, for conversation's sake, they're in Cana of Galilee or Capernaum. More likely Capernaum, because that became headquarters. We know that the first time Jesus was ever in Galilee, ready for this, was in Cana. What did he do in Cana? He changed the water into wine. That's the first time uh, that, that we have in biblical record. As his ministry began, somebody's going to, well, what did he do as a kid? I have no clue. I don't even know what, you know, elementary school he went to. So don't ask those things. Um, but then we're going to have to ask this, and I, here, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you an extra few minutes, because if I start this, we'll be here till noon, uh, noon tomorrow. <laughs> because this is what I found interesting. Why, of all places, would he go to Galilee? Why had he told, what had he told them before? Did they get the significance of Galilee? And I want you to understand not only the historicity behind Galilee, but I want you to get the prophecy that's behind Galilee. Because it's an obscure place. When we talk about Jesus, we think Jerusalem, right? Right? We think, what other place? Bethany, Bethsaida, Nazareth. How about that? Because he was called, just called a few verses before this, Jesus of Nazareth. So we, we tie all these together. And we say, where would Jesus make his earthly home? And we don't know because Jesus says, I have no home, no place to put my head. But where would he, why would he choose this area? And these are all good questions. I'm glad you asked them. Um, next week, I'm going to answer as best as I can this idea. And I got like five pages on it. So. Um, because here's what I want you to do. I want you to understand what I said at the first class, and I'm going to say it again. There's a lot of fulfilled prophecies in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John of his first coming, his first advent. Specifically, that last week of Christ's life on earth, and then later his resurrection and ascension appearances. There's a lot of material on that that says this is a prophecy and here's it fulfilled. But there's other places where prophecy is fulfilled, and you've got to know something about the Word of God. And you've got to ask yourself the hard questions. Why? Now, first of all, I'm going to be honest with you. It's a, I said, why Galilee? You realize Galilee is not a city. Galilee is a huge area. A huge area. And, ready for this? You can go home and do your homework. Certain parts of Israel were occupied by certain tribes. They were given tribal bear, uh, borders within the nation of Israel where you're supposed to live. So go home and find out who was supposed to live in Galilee. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. A lot of his disciples had come from the Galilean area. It's just something to think about. So let's pray. And I just gave you a few minutes. Father, we thank you again for this time as we've looked intently at the text and as we travel through uh, Matthew chapter 28 and the parallel passages, help us again to focus on the, the uh, order of things that occurred to prove that you were pr truly the Messiah, truly God in human flesh, that did exactly what he was, came to do, to set up a kingdom and all the uh, benefits that would come with it when it does get established. But more than that, you also came to be a savior. And everything that was done at the cross proved that you were the Savior to not only save your own people and forgive their sins, but the, the people of the entire world, as John says it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be dismissed.